Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome and thank you for attending QR Lending's Mortgage Compliance Webinar today. I am Denise Banke, Loan Coordinator at QR Lending, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Just to put things in perspective, at this time last year, both the Lending Community and the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau were busy with changes to the Dodd-Frank rules. The CFPB would announce key rule clarifications and amendments in September and October of last year. And lenders were scrambling to get their loan origination system and documentation ready by January 1, 2014. Today, we will review some of those changes and give you an idea of what is ahead. We encourage you to submit questions during the presentation and after by email. We will prepare a complete Q&A and forward to all attendees as soon as it is compiled. Our speaker today will be our own Robert McPherson, Assistant Vice President, Senior Compliance and Fair Lending Officer. But before I turn it over to Robert, I'd like to say a few words about why QR Lending is concerned about compliance. That's because we provide mortgage services exclusively to community financial institutions nationwide. We originate, process, underwrite, close, and service loans for our community banks. Our customers may choose some or all of our services and do as little or as much of the process as they wish. We provide the technology for them to originate loans for their own portfolio, as well as those loans they sell to QR Lending. And the knowledgeable staff at QR Lending has over 250 years of combined community lending experience. And now, I would like to welcome Robert McPherson. Thank you, Denise. As an industry, we are quite accustomed to ever-changing and increasing regulation. I don't know that any of us could have foreseen the volume and complexity of the regulations that would be generated by Dodd-Frank. Our objectives for today's webinar are to help you gain a better understanding of some of the compliance challenges ahead, to review the changes from 2014 and some of the effects of those changes, and to provide some pointers that can help ease the burden of compliance for your bank. Today's topics will include common third-party compliance issues, including joint intent and the new early disclosures, a brief recap of the Dodd-Frank changes from January of this year, the combined good faith estimate and truth in lending disclosures, and upcoming proposed changes to the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. Let's try to focus on each of these four topics individually. We have broken the common third-party compliance issues into two sections. ECOA, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, and the early three-day disclosures required in 2014. First, ECOA and the Joint Intent Provision. If you attended our webinar last year, this was our first topic of discussion and remains at the top this year as well due to continued observances of this issue. One of the easiest areas to be cited under the Act is the Joint Intent Rule. Joint applications must show intent by the borrowers and is covered at the top of page one of the Standard Loan Application, or 1003. The regulations expressly state that this signature must be distinct and separate from the signatures that affirm the accuracy of the information. This means that the signatures at the end of the application, which is an affirmation of the veracity of the application, would not be acceptable for joint intent because you are not allowed to combine joint intent with any other statement. Additionally, just because the applicants are both signers on the deed or other assets, it does not mean that they have intended to apply jointly for credit. Finally, many institutions ask how to handle a joint application for credit when it is taken by phone. As part of the interview process, the applicant can be asked if they intend to apply jointly, so that when the borrower is either sent the 1003 or comes in to sign the 1003, that the signatures are obtained and the correct box is checked indicating intent. So Robert, let me see if I've got this straight. If you have the borrower on the phone and the borrower has indicated that the income or assets of the spouse will be used for the loan qualification, I can just check the right box on the top of page one of the 1003 and get both of their signatures at a later date or at closing? Correct, you would obtain their signature at a later date. So then that same rule applies if I get an application by mail or from the internet or if I just get one signature, even on a face-to-face -face application? No, if they apply by any method besides the phone, you are going to need to obtain both signatures. 
Now we're going to talk about the new early disclosures introduced in 2014. In talking about these two new disclosures that were introduced, we're speaking to the Home Ownership Counseling Disclosure from the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, or RESPA, and the Valuation Disclosure from the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, or the ECOA. These two disclosures join the rest of the early disclosures, such as the Good Faith Estimate, Initial Truth in Lending, and the Servicing Transfer Disclosures. We know from RESPA that we have three days to provide the counseling disclosure once we have the required information, which would be a name, income, social security number, property address, property value, loan amount, and any additional information requested by the institution. So just as you would not give a GFE on a pre-qualification today, you would not give a counseling disclosure either. It helps to remember as well that sales contracts are not one of the required items either if you are attempting to establish a property address. So this disclosure, which gives a list of 10 home ownership counseling services available to the customer, can be based around either the zip code of the property address or the borrower's current address. And the data must be no older than 30 days from the application's date. But what about the ECOA? ECOA's time frame begins at what the regulation defines as an application, which is an oral or written request for an extension of credit that is made in accordance with procedures used by a creditor for the type of credit requested. So today, where you may not give other early disclosures if you deny or cancel a loan within three days of application, ECOA actually requires you give this disclosure. Additionally, you should remember if you have completed a valuation during those three days, such as an HPE score from Freddie Mac, you need to provide this valuation to the borrower. There are some caveats to the ECOA's appraisal rule, however. Perhaps the loan is for business purposes, but you discover weeks after application that the borrower is securing the loan against their home, and it's going to be in the first lien position. The law does provide for this situation. You have three business days after you determine the change has occurred to notify the applicant about their right to receive appraisals. And now we'll move to our second compliance topic for today, a brief recap of the January 2014 Dodd-Frank mortgage rule changes. The CFPB refers to the new mortgage origination and servicing rules that began to take effect over the past year as the Title 14 rules. Odds are, if you are on this webinar, your institution has experienced change as a result of some or all of these rules. Let's cover each of these changes in brief. The first rule shown on this slide went into effect on January 10, 2014. First is the ability to repay, or ATR, and qualified mortgage, or RQM, rule. This rule set the minimum standards for loan underwriting standards in the ATR portion and then expanded legal protections to lenders, making what the Bureau considers less risky loans that are certified as qualified mortgages. Second is the 2013 HOPA rule. Statistically, a very small amount of loans originated in the previous year qualified as high-cost HOPA loans, but the rule did make two important changes. Principally, it changed the definition of a high-cost loan by changing the characteristics of a HOPA loan from high-cost and excessive APR to high-cost or excessive APR. That change was followed by a requirement for all federally related mortgages, high-cost or not, to have a written disclosure of home ownership counselors, which we covered earlier in the webinar. The third rule, which took effect, was a series of changes to loan originator compensation rules. These changes defined what is acceptable for loan originator compensation, compensation between lenders and brokers, as well as the prohibition of financing credit insurance and a change which took effect in 2013, eliminating mandatory arbitration clauses from mortgage loan documentation. The fourth and final rule from January 10th were a series of changes to TILA and RESPA for mortgage servicing rules. While there are too many changes to cover here, the main points of change dealt with loss mitigation, formal establishment of servicing policies and procedures, and air resolution or information requests. On January 18th, the final two mortgage rules for 2014 came into effect. First is the Higher Price Mortgage Loan, or HPML, appraisal rule. This rule is limited in scope in that it only applies to non-QM closed-end loans secured by the borrower's principal dwelling. It establishes special requirements and standards for the appraisal ordered along with additional rules aimed at properties being flipped in a short period of time with a high increase in value. Second is the ECOA Valuations Rule, which we covered earlier in the webinar. 
This rule covers all first lien loans on a dwelling, and because it is under the ACOA, this includes loans for consumer and business purposes. Also note the usage of the word valuation instead of appraisal. This means that any valuation developed in accordance with the credit application using data that is not publicly available must be furnished to the applicant under certain timing rules. And now on to our third compliance topic, the impending integration of the Truth in Lending and Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act disclosures. Mandated by the Dodd-Frank Act, the new integrated TILA and RESPA rules ends an over three decades old practice of requiring two different sets of disclosures to be provided to consumers applying for mortgages. Since these rules were originally developed by two different agencies, the Federal Reserve Board for TILA and the Department of Housing and Urban Development for RESPA, lenders and borrowers alike have suffered through inconsistent and contradictory rules that led to confusion more often than not. To end this confusion, the CFPB has been working with the industry and general public since mid-2012 to create new disclosures and rules that end the discrepancies and bring consistency to the mortgage disclosure process. So for applications received on or after August 1, 2015, the CFPB's new rules will take effect, designed to eliminate the confusion by combining the two regulations forms into one set of disclosures for estimates and another set for closing. The loan estimate is created by retiring the good faith estimate and initial truth in lending disclosures. This new form operates under many of the same rules as the disclosures it will replace, which we will address shortly. The closing disclosure is the replacement for the HUD-1 settlement statement and the final truth in lending form. Much like the estimate, it inherits many of the rules as the disclosures it is replacing, and we will also cover the highlights of those changes. We will start with the loan estimate disclosure, and to do that, we have to address an important change to the regulation. This change concerns the definition of an application. If you look at the list presented, it should be very familiar because it is what RESPA is now, but there is one major change. Whereas RESPA today has a seventh information item that is up to the discretion of the lender, the new definition of application does not. This means that once a borrower submits the six items, which again are a name, income, social security number, property address, property value, and loan amount, the clock begins ticking to provide your disclosures. You can no longer require additional information, such as a date of birth, product type, loan term, or other information. The CFPB has made it very clear that those six items are all that should be needed to disclose the loan estimate form. Having defined what an application is, we can now address the timing and delivery of this disclosure. Much like the GFE and initial TILs issued today, this disclosure must be issued within three business days of receipt of the application. For this particular disclosure, a business day is defined as a day on which the creditor's offices are open to the public for carrying out substantially all of its business functions. So if you do not have offices open on Saturdays in which a customer can conduct almost or all of the business offered by your institution, you do not count a Saturday. Additionally, much like the disclosure rules currently in place, there is a seven business day rule preventing consummation unless a bona fide financial emergency exists, such as an immediate foreclosure. As far as delivery, the timing rules have not changed in that hand delivering documents is still considered delivered that day while mailing documents are considered received on the third day after sending. It is important to note that in a wholesale transaction, where your institution is not the creditor, you are still able to provide the loan estimate disclosure on your creditor's behalf. However, take note that you are required to retain record of this disclosure for three years after consummation of the transaction. There is no requirement on the record keeping method, but electronic record keeping is allowed instead of paper file retention. Before we move on, it does bear mentioning that there is an important note for applications taken prior to August 1, 2015. For these applications, you are required by law to continue using the current disclosures, which would be the GFE, TIL, and HUD-1, and the current rules. You are not allowed to begin using the new forms and new rules on those applications. 
The new loan estimate contains much of the same information that we provide to customers today, but consolidated into a central location. It is three pages long and generally cannot be altered outside of some variations provided in the regulation and placement of a company logo or motto. Much like an initial TIL or GFE, page one contains basic information such as loan amount, interest rate, projected payments, details of features such as prepayment penalties or balloon payments, along with escrow information and estimated closing costs. The second page contains information that is similar to a GFE, with a list of origination charges, services the borrower can shop and cannot shop for, taxes, prepaid items, and other costs and credits. If the product is an ARM, there will also be additional boxes containing payment information and how rate changes will work. The third page has information pertaining to how the loan will look in five years, the APR, and a new figure called the total interest percentage or TIP, which is the amount of interest paid over the loan term as a percentage of the loan amount. The third page also has statements that are similar to the bottom of a TIL, covering assumptions, homeowner's insurance requirements, and late payment information. Additionally, there are statements that mirror the ECOA valuation language and the RESPA servicing transfer disclosure. Finally, there is the option to have a confirmation signature statement at the bottom of the form acknowledging the borrower has received the form, although this is not required by law. Much of the new regulation hinges on whether or not a loan estimate disclosure is delivered in good faith. To that end, the CFPB defines whether or not a loan estimate was made in good faith by calculating the difference between the estimated charges originally provided in the loan estimate and the actual charges paid by or imposed on the consumer in the closing disclosure, which we will address shortly. So if a charge paid by or imposed on a consumer exceeds the amount originally disclosed on the loan estimate, it is not in good faith regardless of whether the creditor later discovers this error or not. But much like today's comparison page on a HUD-1 to a GFE, if a creditor charges less than the amount disclosed, this is considered in good faith no matter what the difference. To that end, there are changes that have no tolerance limitation and can change, such as prepaid interest, property insurance, or services required by the creditor that the consumer was permitted to shop for that the borrower did not select from the list of service providers and charges paid to third-party service providers that were not required by the creditor. Remember, if you are going to permit a borrower to shop for a service provider and you do not furnish a list of service providers, then you will be bound to your estimated charges. There will still be a cumulative tolerance of 10% on certain other fees similar to the list used in the regulation today. This would be recording fees, services the consumer can shop for that they select from your service provider list, and charges not retained by the creditor or its affiliate. It is important to note that if the borrower selects a service provider not on the provided list, then that fee is removed from the cumulative 10% tolerance pool the same way it is handled today. This also includes fees that you estimate but you do not actually charge. Zero tolerance charges are also similar to fees today with one important chart change. Excuse me. Origination fees, or those fees paid to a broker, creditor, or affiliate, and transfer taxes continue to be zero tolerance. But now any fees paid to an unaffiliated third party that the consumer was not permitted to shop for are included in this category. Remember that pass-through fees paid for bona fide third party charges are not considered a fee retained by a broker creditor or affiliate and thus not an origination fee. If a loan should happen to close out of tolerance, the creditor must refund the excess no later than 60 days after consummation. The reimbursement calculation is identical to today's RESPA rules. Zero tolerance reimbursement is any amount above the disclosed estimate and 10% tolerance reimbursement is the amount above the 10% tolerance. However, much like today's process, there is a way to issue revised loan estimates that help to keep the loan file in tolerance and in good faith. So in order to close a loan in good faith, the CFPB has outlined a system similar to the existing change circumstances as we know them today from RESPA. These change circumstances continue to encompass a rate lock, 
when an estimate expires because the consumer did not express an intent to proceed after 10 business days, or changes requested by the consumer. This last item is important. If the consumer requests the changes to the terms or settlement of the loan, it is usually permissible to redisclose. Creditors will still be able to issue revised disclosures if the eligibility of the loan changes. This includes situations related to the consumer's ability to qualify, such as the discovery of incorrect income in the underwriting process from the application, or if the appraisal indicates a much lower home value than used in the estimated disclosures. Anytime there is an event beyond control of the parties involved, a redisclosure is usually permissible. This would be for natural disasters, such as tornadoes or earthquakes directly impacting the consumer or the transaction, or if a title business underwriting the loan goes out of business while attempting to underwrite the title, or if newly discovered information, such as needing a more enhanced appraisal, comes as a result of the initial appraisal. But when is redisclosure not permitted? The CFPB makes it clear that even if you have a valid reason to redisclose, it may not be permissible to do so. Remember, redisclosure is so that you can meet the definition of in good faith. So if the change circumstance is valid, but it is to lower the estimate of charges, or it is a raise in charges, but still within the 10% tolerance for fees from that category, it would not be valid to redisclose. The only change circumstance that does not require a justifiable reason for redisclosure is if the loan estimate had expired 10 business days from issuance due to consumer inactivity. Similar to today's timing rules, any revisions must be delivered or placed in the mail no more than three business days after the change circumstance occurs. When it comes to consummation, the borrower must receive any revised loan estimate no later than four business days prior to consummation. This means if you are sending it by mail, you would need to provide it seven business days before consummation. Note that if you send these by mail or electronically, and you can prove they received these documents on a certain date, that would supersede the three days in the mail rule. One last mention before we move to the closing disclosure. If you have already issued the closing disclosure to the consumer, you cannot issue a revised loan estimate. If a change circumstance occurs in the four-day window, the closing disclosure can reflect the change circumstance, and if it's later than even that point, the closing disclosure provided at consummation can be updated. Now that we've covered the loan estimate and how to update it and keep it in good faith for the closing, we will now address the closing disclosure. The closing disclosure replaces the existing HUD-1 and final till to consummate the transaction. Much like those forms act today, it is expected to contain the actual terms and costs of the transaction and be accurate. The new, dis the new document is five pages long and cannot be altered too much from its original format. The first page contains general information and loan terms and payment information, along with the costs at closing. The second page looks very similar to page two of a HUD-1, but instead of the lines such as the 800s or 900s, it is broken up into the same sections as displayed in the loan estimate to allow the consumer to compare. The third page contains the cash to close calculation along with credits and generally contains information that used to be found on page one of the HUD-1 for the summary of transactions. The fourth page is very explanative over different loan disclosures such as demand features, assumptions, late payments, and an explanation of escrow accounts and ARM information if applicable. Finally, the fifth page contains all the calculations you would normally find on the final till such as the APR, total payments, finance charge, and amount financed, along with the previously mentioned new field, the total interest percentage. Also on the fifth page is a table containing contact information for the lender, mortgage broker, real estate broker for buyer and seller if applicable, and the settlement agent along with relevant NMLS information where applicable. The new regulation also establishes a new three-day business waiting rule before, period before consummation where this disclosure must be provided. The timing and delivery rules are similar as established under the loan estimate, varying depending on physical delivery or placing the disclosure in the mail. However, 
Business Day now includes all calendar days except Sundays and federal holidays. This three-day period can be waived, but like the loan estimate disclosure timing waiver rules, it must be for a bona fide financial emergency, such as an impending foreclosure. A note on multiple borrower transactions. Each borrower that has a right to rescind under TILA must receive this disclosure. But if the transaction is not rescindable, then only the primary borrower need receive a copy of this disclosure. To assist with distributing this disclosure, it is acceptable for a settlement agent to provide the disclosure on the creditor's behalf. However, it is still the responsibility of the creditor to make sure this form is accurate and submitted timely. You cannot outsource the risk of this disclosure. Also, the settlement agent in a purchase transaction is required to give a copy of the closing disclosure to the seller as well and can give the buyer's version to the seller if it contains the information the seller needs. If the settlement agent decides to provide the seller a different version that is only applicable to the seller, the creditor must obtain a copy of that form for record retention purposes. Similar to issuing a revised TIL three business days prior to consummation today, the closing disclosure is bound to the same rules. Under the following conditions, a new three-day waiting period would be triggered if discovered during the first three-day waiting period. If the disclosed APR becomes inaccurate, which is defined further in TILA, if the loan product changes, or if a prepayment penalty is added. For all other changes that were not previously listed, any corrected closing disclosure can be presented at consummation. But be aware that customers do have a right to review their closing disclosure one business day prior to consummation. The form presented to the consumer must be as accurate as possible at the time the consumer makes the request. Creditors can work with the settlement agents to permit them to view the disclosure. But even after consummation, the creditor may be required to issue a new closing disclosure to the consumer. If an event in connection with the settlement occurs during the 30 calendar day period after consummation, closing, causing the disclosure to be inaccurate, then the creditor must send a new closing disclosure to the consumer not more than 30 business days after receiving information sufficient to establish the event has occurred. Additionally, as discussed on the loan estimate disclosures, any tolerance cures must be reflected in a new closing disclosure no later than 60 calendar days after the violation occurs. Due to time constraints, we are only going to briefly cover some of the other changes that come with the integrated TILA RESPA rule. A new form has been created for servicers and is issued as a post-consummation document. This form is required to be sent by servicers to consumers when the escrow account for the consumer is closed by the servicer or the consumer. The CFPB has provided example forms on its website of a list of service providers the consumer can shop for and a form that shows a list of service providers the consumer cannot shop for. Record retention requirements are made very clear. Three years for loan estimate forms and five years for the closing disclosure forms that is five years from consummation. Finally, this rule does not apply to HELOCs, reverse mortgages, or chattel, those being loans secured by a dwelling that is not attached to real property such as land. And lastly on today's list of compliance topics, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, or HUMDA. Recently released by the CFPB and striking terror in the hearts of lending data reporters everywhere is the changes to the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. Before saying anything on this topic, it is important to note that this rule is only in the commentary period. That is to say, it is not the final rule. There's a lot of fear and misconception about this change, but the CFPB is trying to get opinions and comments from the industry and public about how the data should be expanded to be useful and the expansion does stand to be great. If you report HUMDA now, you know that it can be a pain getting the 35 or so fields you have to report correct, but that could expand into over 100 fields per loan depending on what changes are finalized in the rule. The good news is if you currently report what is referred to commonly by regulators as HUMDA plus data, 
then these changes may not be as severe as you think. There are, however, a lot of concerns by public and industry alike that too much data will make it possible for individual consumers to be identified from what should be largely anonymous data. As we await the final rule, it is most likely safe to say that this rule will most likely not take effect until at least 2016. After all, the integrated TILA RESPA rules debuted in mid-2012 and are not going into effect until mid-2015. More time, or perhaps another webinar on this section alone may be warranted, but we must leave that for another day. Okay, so let's recap the four topics that we've covered today. First, common third-party compliance issues, including joint intent and the new early disclosures. Second, a brief recap of the Dodd-Frank changes from January of this year. Third, the new combined good faith estimate and truth in lending disclosure. And fourth, upcoming proposed changes to the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. In summary, there are a few ways to cope with the changes coming in the next year. It is always good to be proactive with your software vendors and see how they are planning on dealing with these changes. As was evidenced in 2010, you cannot always rely on your technology provider to just update your processes for you or to follow the regulations the way you would need them to. Another point to consider is that these changes discussed today are not secondary marketing dictated items. This means that you cannot simply originate loans to your portfolio to avoid following these new rules. And unlike the exemptions for small lenders that came out in 2014 for QM and servicing rules, the integrated TILA and RESPA rules even the playing field for all participants in the mortgage industry. And there are many parts of the TILA RESPA rules that we did not cover due to time constraints, but now I would like to hand it back to Denise. Thanks, Robert. Remember, QR Lending is here to help with compliance. What makes us different from anyone else? That's easy. We supply all the technology. You get your personal loan coordinator for all your needs, one name, one phone number, one email address, and of course, we never cross out your members. If you have not submitted your questions during the presentation, please submit them to me at dbanky at qrlending.com or you can contact me directly with questions by phone at 888-766-4734, extension 7936. Once we have compiled all of the questions and answers, we will be sending them to all of today's attendees, along with a link to the CFPB TILA RESPA implementation page. Also, if you'd like a copy of today's presentation, just call or drop me a line. We will leave the contact information on the screen for your convenience. Thank you for your time and attention, and have a great day.